Welcome to the Experts in Sport podcast, brought to you by the School of Sport, Exercise and Health Sciences at Loughborough University. This podcast seeks to bring together the worlds of academia and professional practice. If you're interested in the latest research and trends in sport and want to hear from experts from around the world, then subscribe now because this is the podcast for you. I'm your host, Martin Foster, Applied Sport Management Lead at Loughborough University. Today, we're here with Dr. Richard Blagrove, lecturer in physiology here at Loughborough University and ultra endurance athlete Tom Evans. We're here to talk about strength training for endurance. In today's podcast, we talk to Tom about the kind of training volume required to be an ultra endurance athlete. We hear Rich and Tom discuss how strength training can be incorporated into an endurance program. We hear how listening to your body and fitting your training around your life is essential for performance. Finally, we hear how running economy can benefit from strength training, including the type of training and exercises that people training for endurance should benefit from. Hi Rich, hi Tom. Um, thanks for coming in today to talk to us about strength training uh, for endurance. Um, before we get started, can we just have a brief introduction from you both, um, starting with Rich? Yeah, thanks a lot for inviting us on today, Martin. Uh, so I'm Rich Blager, I'm a lecturer here in physiology and also the programme director for the Masters in Strength and Conditioning. And yeah, I guess we're going to talk a little bit about endurance running today and specifically about strength training for endurance athletes, which has been my main background really over the last 12 years. Um, like I've been working with endurance athletes uh, right from recreational level to elite level, including a couple of athletes that have made like Olympic finals, won medals at major international championships. Um, so yeah, hoping to dive into some questions with Tom today about his strength training and, and how he applies principles of strength training. Brilliant. And yourself, Tom? And good morning, Martin. Good morning, Rich. Yep, so my name's Tom Evans. Uh, I am a recently turned professional ultra-distance trail runner, um, but do all sorts of distances. Um, I signed up to my first race, it's a race called Marathon de Saab, 250-kilometre race across the desert as part of a drunken bet. Um, <laughs> that was two and a half years ago, um, and I'm now... Yeah, professional trail runner, ranked third in the world, um, but also, like I said, do other dist distances uh, and have just got back from European Cross Country Championships in Lisbon, uh, where we got a team gold. Nice. Before we do carry on, and I'm going to let you guys talk a lot, I just want to know, how did you do after the drunken bet? Uh, the drunken bet was a, it was pretty, it was a, yeah, a strange, a strange thing to bet. I had some friends who did it in 2016. Uh, I bet that I could do better after a couple of pints. And 2017 came around, um, and I ended up being the first non-sub-Saharan African to podium in the race uh, in 35 years of the race, with very little training as my first ever race. Never done a park run, never done a 10k or anything. Um, and yeah, it was pretty horrendous as I'm sure you can imagine carrying six days worth of food with you from day one running in heats of up to like 45, 46 degrees but yeah so I guess oh, I, I must have got the bug from there and um, yeah I now look forward to these things which is slightly <laughs> bizarre that's, that's pretty amazing I think me and Rich have done a podcast previously and we've talked about needing to do one on genetics we certainly do need to do that in the future um, which I think we will but for now we're going to talk about strength training uh, for endurance athletes um, I'm going to take a seat back um, and let Rich as an expert researcher speak to Tom as an elite athlete and we're going to find out a lot more about strength training uh, for endurance I might come in with a few questions here and there um, but mainly I'll leave it to you guys so over to you guys thank you yeah, thanks a lot Martin um, yeah, you, you mentioned before that you've just come back from the European Cross Country Championships in Lisbon. Like, it was a really exceptional performance to make the team. Um, I think unexpected to, to some extent that an ultra marathon runner kind of steps in to the trial event at Liverpool with the best 5k, 10k runners in the country, and you were up there mixing it with, with those guys. I think you finished, was it fifth? Fifth overall? In the uh, yeah, fifth overall. Yeah, and then you went on to finish, was it 44th at the European yeah. Championships? And win the team gold medal, which was uh, which yeah, which was a fantastic achievement. Like, how did you find the experience out there? Was there anything that you kind of learned about the preparation for those races that will help you? Yeah, distance? definitely. So I think taking a taking a step backwards, I I got injured at the end of July. Um, I had a knee problem. wasn't entirely sure what it was. Had a couple of scans. Still not fully diagnosed. Um, 
I was supposed to be racing the mountain running world championships, but just couldn't get enough volume at the right intensity to be able to perform at a standard that I would have been happy with. So we sort of took it took it all the way back to basics and sort of actually really focused on strength and conditioning. Um, especially sort of knee stability, hip stability, making sure everything's lining up um, that would then in process help my biomechanics. And we were able to get the quality of training in, be able to get that intensity, but not, I wasn't, I say brave enough or there, for me, there was no point in risking it at this early stage in my career. Um, so actually we thought, right, let's focus on a bit shorter distances, like up to 10, 12 K perhaps. Um, which I'm sure for some people seems like a long way, but I think as advice it's just all it's all relative. And mm. so entered Milton Keynes cross country um, that went went really well, finished third there, and sort of thought right at that point entered Liverpool. And I guess the goal from the build up was was qualifying. Mm. Um, Liverpool itself is a race that's going to suit me because it's muddy generally. It's muddy. <laughs> it's a little bit slower. So actually. Me maybe being able to run my 10 kpb is like 29.45. I think I could probably run sub 29 now. Yeah. Um, considering the guys who sort of I've, I've been running with, and so yeah, then to go to Liverpool and it was Liverpool. Yeah, Liverpool went really well, and then to qualify for Lisbon to that was incredible, and that was that was the goal from this this build up. So goal achieved. To then go out to Lisbon, which yeah, like you say, you are against the best five 10k runners in Europe mm. and it was just it was just super fast it was relentless there was no yeah. give up yes it was quite a hilly course but they were all short hills there was yeah. no need to grind it was almost it was more anaerobic than aerobic right. on the hills and I yeah. thought actually when I saw the course I thought, oh it's a nice hilly course it should really suit me but the longest climb was 40 seconds yeah. which actually isn't for me it wasn't that beneficial and yes there were some good downhill bits where I like to think my downhill running is is good but I was just so tired yeah. from the uphills um, and yeah to finish 44th like his first Europeans like great obviously I'd like would have liked to have done better but what does my best look like what was I didn't really set a goal for it because the goal was to qualify it was difficult so so for, anything's a bonus from there right? yeah precisely yeah. So for me it was it was being part of the team and trying to facilitate and trying to help the team as well as possible and to walk away with the team gold um, yeah is, is incredible that doesn't happen every day and to be a on paper a 100k 100 yeah. mile runner and to now have sort of hung up in my living room at home uh, yeah on your CV <laughs> yeah a European gold medal is yeah. yeah is incredible and I don't think there are many no, many athletes cool. have done that, and I know there was there was one other um, long distance athlete who's a ski ski mountaineer mm. um, from Norway who was racing, and we finished five places within, oh, really? within each other. So yeah. really interesting to be able to show that actually top end endurance, you it is able to translate. It's not a Absolutely. progression yeah. from eight hundred meters to fifteen hundred meters to three k indoors to five k to ten k. Actually, I've skipped all of that and sort of coming at the long distances and now I'm coming back down and it's nice to show people that actually don't have to have that sort of pedigree background in order to compete for yeah. GB places. Yeah, absolutely. So how will, I think you mentioned uh, before we came on air that you've got a couple of much, much longer races uh, in the next calendar year. Like, how will your training kind of change from the preparation that you had uh, before Liverpool and Lisbon into those long events? Is it just a case of doing a longer run each week or does your overall volume increase quite considerably? So my overall volume does increase. And like typically if I'm going... If I'm training for cross-country and or shorter races, less than, less than 10 miles or maybe even up to half marathon, it will be maximum of 100 miles a week with a session on Tuesday, Thursday and then a fast tempo on Saturday or combined into my long run on Sunday. Whereas when I pick up to the longer distances, so I've got a 100k race in February in New Zealand, um, I will either do, I'll drop one session, the Thursday session I'll drop um, and I'll either do a long run instead of that on Thursday or I was and that may be that will go up to two thirds of the distance or time that I'm going to run so this 
100k race so maybe i'll do a 60k long run that will take in and around four hours um Wow. in the Peak District yeah. and I will still keep a marathon pace tempo in or half marathon pace uh, tempo in and I will still do a a session on Tuesday so in order to increase my lactate turn point or lactate mm. threshold and my VO2 max and actually get faster and that, might, that session might look like 4 by 8 minutes at 10k pace or 8 by 1k with hill reps after three and seven yeah and so it's still typical training and the volume won't go crazy so it might get up to 130 135 miles in this block which sounds pretty crazy to me (laughs) which may seem like a lot but that's if you compare that to a proper elite elite marathon if you compare that to Mo Farah his training at peak volume when he's on training camp in Ethiopia may go up to it'll be similar it'll be very similar to that and Mm. actually you're comparing a just over two hour race to a seven hour race so actually the volume it seems high but yeah. it's not that high because there's still relatively speaking yeah. relatively mm. quite a lot of well there is yeah there still is a lot of a lot of quality yeah in the mix of yeah of sure quantity yeah and certainly with the marathon runners that i've worked with in the past and including a couple that have competed at olympic games have been running similar sorts of volumes so i guess yeah, the, the challenge for me as the strength and conditioning coach is, is how to fit like non-running based conditioning and weight room work into that program. So how, how do you manage to go about that? Like you said, you placed quite a big priority on it um, off the back of this knee injury that you had building into the cross country season. Um, but how do you kind of yeah, integrate strength and conditioning type work into your program? Yeah, I think for me, I think the strength and conditioning is, is really important, but it is, it is definitely an excess to the running I think mm. for me when the moment that and there'll be different parts of in different phases of the season different elements of the periodization throughout the year and throughout training blocks strength and conditioning will play a bigger part but when I sort of go into peak volume of running the strength and conditioning can actually sometimes be really hard to balance because the intensity is there with the running as is the volume and trying to balance that strength and conditioning which I know and it is an essential part of the week and I'll do two strength and conditioning sessions every week except for race week where I'll just do one and yeah. a little bit less volume as well and it's just balancing uh, right do I do it do I really want to do a strength and conditioning session the day before a workout no do I want to do it the day after a long run well actually if it's more of a conditioning session so if I do a one sort of more of a heavyweight power session on a beginning of the week and then more conditioning at the end of the week actually can I do that conditioning so in the conditioning session after a running workout or a running long run yes I can and actually is that going to be beneficial yes if I've recovered as well as I possibly could in between the two sessions and is that specific to what I am training for yes because I need to train at a yeah at a high volume and if I've done a four hour run in the morning actually training volume adds up training stress training stress tolerance does add up and if yeah if I've done four hours in the morning and then an hour and a half in the gym in the afternoon yeah yes there'll be times where I'm sat down hating my life in the gym (laughs) and the rest of the time and the rest of the time but actually that's (laughs) that then turns that's then a really big day that's a five and a half hour volume yeah day because you know, your body doesn't differentiate between different types of stress that's being applied on it and if you can balance that and yeah and especially going into the winter it definitely is a balancing act of being outside for four hours is a long time if it's raining if it's cold you are so much more your immune system's taking a massive battering you're then going into a busy gym that you don't want to be that guy who's sort of sat down sort of putting hand sanitizer on in between every rep and every set but <laughs> washing the bar yeah well, and washing it but that's that's something that you need to consider because your yeah. immune system's down you're then going into a into a slightly crowded place where yeah hygiene is good but it's not perfect as it isn't anywhere and it's just yeah, it's being really yeah. aware of those things and actually have I've done a four hour run this morning I was supposed to go to the gym this afternoon but it was snowing in the Peak District is it worth it and it's I think the thing that I've really learned as an ultra endurance athlete is the times where your body is saying 
I should do this or I shouldn't do this. And it's differentiating that between, right, I'm just tired now or I'm being a bit lazy, or yeah. I should do it, or it's a, actually, is it worth doing it? Like, tomorrow's a new day. Yeah. Is it worth, right, can I change? It's Tuesday now. Can I change my program ever so slightly that it's all going to fit in? And I think that's the beauty of being an endurance athlete where you're not... I'm lucky enough to be able to choose all of my races. I don't have... Yeah, my coach. I, yes, I have a coach. She's based in Sussex, and when I'm when I'm in Sussex, I'll train with her um, in the AB training group. And but it's a right. This the session's going to happen here and here. But around that, I fit things in, and suddenly, I got, I was in the military for eight years before, mm-hmm. and that's given me such a great way of being able to plan my yeah. day. And there's no one telling me, oh, you need to go out and do five hours. Yeah, of running. Like, that's in my program, and it's right. Do I do that on? Monday or Wednesday like how does that work with the rest of my life because yeah. you've got to maintain in a sport where it's so fully immersive and you have to fully buy into it you still need an element of balance like I moved house this week mm. how am I going to it's going to take a bit out of you for yeah. sure how am I going to that's a strength training session yeah, in its exactly. own right moving boxes boxes and beds upstairs and put things together like is it do I reduce my training volume for a couple of days so I can sleep on a bed that I've made yeah. yes well that's a no brainer in the, in the grand scheme of things that's a if you are so strict on following a training mm. program and you're not listening to your body and you've got a little bit of a cold but then you're going to bed at midnight one in the morning because you've been emptying boxes it just doesn't make sense yeah, yeah. and I think that's a and that sort of definitely plays in with strength and conditioning and I do my strength and conditioning sessions are yeah they're really focused on and really specific on the race that I'm training for. Um, so if there's a lot of uphill in a race, then I'll work a lot of my posterior chain sort of exercises like uh, Romanian deadlift or single leg deadlift um, or step ups and box jumps, things to just really get sort of glutes and hamstrings firing. So actually in a, if you're relating that into uh, into a race environment or into a training environment it's those long hills that are becoming a bit of a drag but then there's a step or there's a bit of a ledge or a rock that you've got to do a big step up like the equivalent of you're walking upstairs and you decide actually I'm now going to take two steps instead of one step and it's being able to contract the maximum amount of muscle fibres and create the least amount of damage because if this isn't a one hour race or a two hour race sometimes these races will last 20 hours mm. And in order to reduce the muscle damage at the beginning of the race, so you can, yeah, you can last for longer because actually you don't know what the effect is going to be 15, 18, 20 hours. Yeah, the line. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and just going back to what you were talking about in terms of positioning the strength and conditioning of the week, it's, yeah, it's, it's very much um, how I've gone about doing it before. And I think really the, the main message is it's context specific, it's individual specific. Um, and if, we, I mean, if we look at, the kind of research on that in terms of where we place it around running sessions the majority says we need about six six hours or so of recovery which for a recreational athlete isn't always that possible like you sometimes have to combine sessions or, or do one after the other but certainly with the elite guys that i've worked with like we do similar to you we try and place the heavier strength and conditioning sessions on the same day as actually some of the harder sessions in the week um, and I often term that a kind of polarised type design where if they do a hard in- track interval session or a hard tempo run in the morning on a Tuesday or a Thursday, they have six hours recovery and then they do a, a, a heavy strength training session in the gym, which means the day after is a complete recovery day. So they just go out and run easy for, for 40, 50, 60 minutes maybe. Um, so organising the week in that sort of way seems to be a bit more optimal than doing strength and conditioning on an easy day when a Essentially, then you've got something hard on on most days of yeah. the week. No, and, and I I completely agree with that. And that's the for me that was the real benefit of being able to become a full time athlete. So you've got you've got that time in that day in order to recover. And recovery isn't sadly sort of being sat behind a desk working. It's still stress going in then. So as an elite runner, yeah, that's great. But as a yeah, like you said, as a recreational runner, that may that may not be possible and I'm sure a lot of the people listening are thinking like right how can I get I want to do an ultra marathon or I want to do a yeah. marathon and how do I I've heard training conditioning is important how do I combine that well yes the best way 
research shows is to do it like this. However, there are lots of other ways of doing mm. it. It's completely person specific. Yeah. Do I advise doing a really hard tempo run in the morning? all the intervals on the track in the morning going to work all day and then going to the gym to do a really heavy session at eight in the evening no i mm. probably wouldn't advise that but that may work for you that may work yeah. for your surroundings and it's just thinking like right where can i where can i improve where can i make these gains and it is so individual specific yeah i mean one of the other strategies so again speaking about recreational runners that i've pr- only proposed in a research paper there's not much research on it is rather than doing strength and conditioning sessions, thinking about strength and conditioning as, as training units and trying to microdose different types of uh, strength and conditioning activity throughout the training week, so you almost end up doing something every single day. So, for example, if you're doing a hard session, you might do a small amount of plyometrics before you then go and do the hard session, incorporate it into your warm-up. Um, you might get back from an easy run and do some type of resistance training at home, um, or you might do some sort of trunk training, calf conditioning type training unit after another run in the week. So, rather than trying to dedicate an hour 75 minutes to a strength and conditioning session which takes up quite a lot of time and um, it's just more training added to the overall volume you've kind of got it split up or divided and, and spread throughout the training week which is quite often a little bit easier to manage if you've got yeah work constraints and, and family social constraints that uh, that are taking up a lot of time um just moving on to so you already mentioned a bit about some of the exercises that you do i mean just to kind of put into context um some of what you've already spoken about and some appropriate ways to approach strength and conditioning um so as part of my phd we published a systematic review which looked at all of the research studies that have been published around strength training f- for distance runners um i think there's about 50 or so it's got quite a lot but we uh, we put 26 of those papers into this yeah martin's got it just here <laughs> um we put 26 of those papers into this review but i mean generally across the literature we, we tend to see improvements in um a physiological parameter called running economy um as a result of doing two to three months of, of of strength training so running economy is essentially how much oxygen or i guess more specifically how much energy you're using at a sub-maximal intensity which for for yeah for endurance running has, has obviously got relevance because if we can use less energy or less oxygen move a bit more efficiently then we're saving energy and oxygen for later on in the event and we should be able to uh, run at a faster speed for this for the same level of energy um, most of the research within those studies is, is tended to use heavy resistance training or explosive training and, and sometimes plyometric training as well um, so can you Perhaps would you be able to elaborate on like what types of exercise you use? Like I think you mentioned some posterior chain exercises like Romanian deadlifts, uh, probably squats, I imagine. Yeah. Um, but what other types of exercise do you use, uh, which fall kind of within those training categories? Yeah, so I I found and for yeah for me running economy, the reason why. I will do strength and conditioning. Yes, some research says it helps with injury prevention, but who knows? You could still twist your ankle. It's yeah, not gonna stop jury's it. out still out there on that one. It's not going to stop every injury. Yes, <laughs> yeah. it may help. It may be 1%, 2%, and that's great. But yeah, for me, it's all about running economy. Yeah. And I want to make, for running, I want to make things as easy as possible. I want my body to, if six-minute miling is easy, that's great. Well, what if it's six-minute miling this week how about in four months time can i get that to can i get 555 minutes yeah, yeah easy yeah. because actually those five seconds a mile when you're running 100 miles is a absolutely a huge difference so yeah and i will so yeah in order to boost running economy like we spoke about earlier the heavier session i'll do at the beginning of the week probably on the same day as a harder session yeah that is typically a sort of rep range maybe three to five reps in four to six sets sort of depending on how I'm feeling and depending on the exercises um, normally things are supersetted so I might do sort of heavy squats with uh, eccentric some eccentric calf conditioning mm-hmm. uh, or just some calf holds um, or I might do if I'm sort of doing a bit of a hip complex sort of with a single leg uh, glute bridge weighted may just be sort of really explosive a really explosive movement 
followed by yeah a bit of a hold or another explosive movement yep. um and yeah i sort of do a session like that typically on a tuesday evening sort of after i've done a hard session in the morning um and then thursday which is normally after a bit of a longer run will be a more of a sort of general conditioning session where it might be exercises more with sort of a a larger rep range <laughs> And people sort of say, oh, you're an endurance athlete, you should be doing, like, how many reps do you do thinking you need yeah, to do? Yeah, that's a good point. Yeah. Thinking you need to do loads. Well, no, let's say you're running, let's say you ran, let's say you're a 400 metre runner, for example, on a track, and you're taking a two metre stride for each, yeah, you're taking a two metre stride each stride. So, hopefully my math is going to be right here, <laughs> but you're going to take 200 strides going around the track so that's the equivalent of doing 200 reps or 100 reps mm. on each leg for a 400 meter runner so using that logic each set for a 400 meter runner would be 100 if you're doing single leg calf raises you do 100 on each leg for each set imagine doing for a 100 mile runner it just it just wouldn't work. So actually, yeah. you think like, right, why am I doing this? Right, if I lift heavier, I am using the maximum. I, what I am trying to do when I'm in the gym is use maximum muscle fibers, rec- muscle uh, muscle fiber recruitment to be as high as possible. So everything gets trained, but also I think my yeah, your body then learns how to use the muscle fibers and also which energy system it's going to use to do that there will be times in a race where you need to put an anaerobic effort in it might be a really hard step up or it might be you're jumping across a stream Mm. you've got to have that in your body and if you haven't trained it you're not really going to be able to access it and it's the same with yes going slightly diversing onto energy systems I don't want to I want to be as efficient as possible, use as much oxygen as I can because I want to be fully aerobic for as long as I possibly can. Mm. Because as soon as my body starts producing lactic acid and as soon as I go sort of past my lactate turn point, that's game over. Yeah. Because that could that could happen. There's no going back. That could happen in the first five minutes of a race. Yeah. You do the first mile too quick, right, that's that may catch up in two hours, three hours, it may catch up in ten hours. It's gonna catch up at some point. Yeah. So actually if I can do this strength conditioning work, which on the outside may not I was like oh why is, he's a hundred mile runner why is he doing three repetitions three reps of squats yeah, yeah. and then actually when you explain it and break it down you're like no that makes perfect yeah. sense I'm glad you used that example as well because I mean yeah that's a very very similar example to to ones that I often use when I'm talking to, to runners and their coaches and I mean in strength and conditioning we'd kind of call it the specificity trap a little bit that yeah if, we, if you just look at the biomechanics and the physiology of the sport and you try and simulate it you actually just end up back up running like you say okay we need to do everything on one leg we need to do it through short range we need it to do it through repetition ranges and energy systems that are similar and you just end up back at something that resembles running and if you're already doing 100 120 miles a week like what's what's the point of doing that and so a better way to think about these um kind of non-specific or non-running based activities is trying to train the adaptation that we're looking to get so tom alluded to a couple of them there like we're trying to improve the recruitment of muscle fibers and if we can if we can change the maximal recruitment of muscle fibers we know at a sub-maximal level like you're essentially using a lower relative amount of the total muscle fibers you could recruit um and if we get changes, like we tend to see changes in connective tissue and, and tendon stiffness off the back of resistance training and, and plyometric training as well. And so if we get changes in that, like it's likely we're going to store and return elastic energy a bit more effectively. So that probably also contributes to this change that we see in running economy. Essentially, you're just using your muscles less to do the same the same work. You're using the free energy that we get from, from tendons. Um, and we also see some changes in speed as well. So you mentioned like anaerobic energy systems which yeah you obviously don't use very much at sort of 5k and above and certainly not ultra distance running but if we have to go up a steep hill or we've got to do a sprint finish or there's a surge
surge in a 5k 10k track race then we need to be able to cope with that so if we can access an anaerobic energy system and come back and and retain um aerobic type metabolism then that's going to help us help our uh, overall performance as well Mm, And, and looking at that looking at the speed even if it's the small speed of your ground contact time when you're yes running 100 meters obviously is incredibly important 400 meters very important but actually when you go up to 100 miles or 100 kilometers that ground contact time all adds up when you've yes you're going to need to put your foot on the floor but actually when you're on when your foot's hitting the ground it's breaking you want to break for as short a time as possible and if you can reduce your ground contact time when you're right when yeah in any running then that is only going to be beneficial to you the less time spent braking is better if you imagine in a car yeah. if you just sort of you don't want to break some from way out from a roundabout and sort of go into a turn and it is this yeah it's the same with if you imagine running down a slalom ski slope you're sort of going left right left right as of lots of switchbacks hairpin turns actually having that strength and that control to be able to flow through it rather than mm. braking stopping turning keeping on going stopping all you're trying to do is make life as easy for yourself as possible and yeah. by being quick and being light on your feet over 100 miles it makes such a huge difference yeah absolutely and sort of bringing it back to finish off I, I guess to um, to ultra distance running like we know fairly well that over 5k 10k half marathon marathon that running economy vo2 max which is the maximum amount of oxygen that we can use and lactic threshold are sort of the most important physiological determinants but when we get up to sort of 50k 80k and then over 100k like the science just kind of isn't there like they're very very difficult events to research so we don't really know um, what physiological determinants Determinants and attributes that are that important, um, but certainly up to about 80k. Like it seems that running economy, the speed that we can elicit at VO2 max, which are heavily influenced by by strength training, are are really important determinants. Yeah, I think for me, and I, I get some maximal testing done. I actually this afternoon I'm sort of going to the lab in Loughborough to to do sub maximal and maximal because I, I think it's it is really important. You want to run as quickly as you I want to be able to run as quickly as I can without producing lactic acid mm. and as quickly and depending on what that is is yeah if it's six minute miles great if it's seven minute miles great but as if you know what it is you're then not going to go over it and yes uh, pace isn't pace is only one element of it what if you start going up a hill what if you start going down a hill what if it's hot what if it's cold it sort of all combines into feel into heart rate as well so that's but that's another that's another podcast for another day. yeah and yeah economy is and my economy tests always last way longer than they should and i'll sort of bring in previous data and they'll say yeah. oh i think they've probably done this wrong but my sub maximum has ended up being sort of an hour an hour 15 minutes and yeah. they're like well, are you sure you want to do your maximal now? Because yeah. they just weren't expecting it. Like a little bit of lactic acid, and it just stays low, and it just stays low, and it just yeah. stays low for a long time. And it's like that's yes, probably is slightly genetic, but from doing strength and conditioning is only going to improve. Yeah, you can give it a little nudge. Yeah, and what I was going to say, uh, mentioned before, is like over a hundred kilometers. Like what we do know from the science is like one major limiting factor is muscle damage that you referred to before. So like it probably plays a little bit of a role in sort of marathon distances, but when you get to that sort of duration of running like the extent of muscle damage that you've got is is, is a huge limiting factor to, for performance so there has been some speculation in the scientific literature that some things like eccentric dominant training where your muscles lengthening under tension and doing plyometrics like might offset the amount of muscle damage you get so for those types of distances where we're up at sort of 100 100 kilometers plus like doing yeah eccentric dominant types of training like those um should take priority and like I don't know if you use any of, of, of those sorts of training yeah and certainly for certainly for a race that's got lots of downhill running will be really specific on sort of eccentric quad loading and sort of knee stability because that's where running downhill is where the major damage yeah. is caused like I'll do recovery runs on a treadmill and it might it might even be it might be uh, physiologically or cardiovascularly even not a recovery run because heart rate will probably get quite high but actually 
the amount of tension, the amount of pressure going onto the legs, running uphill, isn't that much, which mm. is brilliant. And it's a great recovery tool. And I've got a stupid treadmill at home that goes to 40%. Um, <laughs> Which, yeah, which is amazing because actually muscle damage, not very much, but you yeah. then put it on, the treadmill also goes to a 6% decline. You do a hard session on that and you know about it. You know it. about it the next um, step, yeah, sure. And it's, right, do I... Running, doing a 10 kilometer downhill, what benefit am I getting from that? It's, yeah, it's benefit versus muscle damage. Can I achieve a similar benefit from doing some eccentric loading in the gym? Yes. Is the muscle damage going to be as bad? No. But if I still achieve what I want to achieve, yes. Well, that then makes complete sense to do it mm. because do I want to run? Like It's all about the process. Mm. And, and that within the process is the consistency. And I'm not talking consistency from, yes, it is from session to session, week on week, month on month but it's also year on year like I will absolutely yeah. in an ideal world I, w- I, will, I would love to be able to target the marathon at Paris mm. and if I'm the most consistent runner from now till then I, I don't see why I can't race a 100 mile race four months before yeah, and then race a selection event if there is one and then go into Paris and I may even be on the start line of a marathon early next year Hope so. And good good yeah, to see you doing a marathon. Be yeah. Interesting to see to see what happens. And yeah. Yeah, it's a good point to finish on that. That like it's often referred to as the cardinal rule of training that you've just got to be consistent. Um, and I think for well-trained and elite runners, it's, it sort of sounds quite obvious that you just need to train consistently over years and years. And like those types of athletes are quite motivated. But in order to train consistently, you've got to avoid injury, illness, overtraining. And so if part of avoiding injury is doing strength and conditioning, then like it's something that a lot of people should be including in their, in their training. I think, I think for me, I think this talk has been amazing because I've sat here and not had to say an, a word and you two have spoken, covered everything we wanted to cover. Um, so I think it's been absolutely brilliant. Can we just, to finish, Tom, would you just want to give us the, a recommendation for an endurance run of what you would say, kind of training volume load, you know, endurance, whatever day, strength, and then can you just add to it what the research might say to that? Um, you know, it might conflict, it might not, but it'd be interesting to see both sides. It sounds like you're both on the same page, so that's pretty cool. So, yeah. so Tom, what would you advise an endurance runner? What should they do in a week, just an average endurance run? Uh, so I'd take, if I took my, uh, I'd take my Saturday. So wake up, Saturday I tend to use as like a race replication day. So it'll be a sort of a tempo run. Um, so get up, breakfast two, three hours before, tempo run will be anything up to 20 miles at marathon pace and yeah after that sort of come back chill out for a little bit and then and then after that it's time to go to the gym so probably yes in an ideal world six hours but sometimes that may not happen you may have things to do dogs to walk all of these things <laughs> uh life that gets in the way and then yeah it will be my sort of more conditioning session so slightly higher rep range slightly lower sets so exercises such as um over a reverse lunge with a little bit of an eccentric load um kettlebell swings uh pull-ups press-ups calf raises so the exercise that i can do a little bit more volume on without achieving a huge amount of muscle damage um and then after that so probably an easy easy shake up run afterwards um so just to prime myself for for my sunday long run so it would be a pretty typical saturday with lots mm. of food in between <laughs> and what would you advise rich so a training a training week let's say what, what would you advise there I think from an endurance perspective, like a lot of the research that's been done over the last 10 years is kind of showing that like a polarised model seems to work quite well with an 80-20 split. So what I mean by that is 80% of your total running mileage or volume for within a week should be at a fairly easy pace, like kind of recovery run type intensity. And that should be performed quite strictly. So probably somewhere around 60% max heart rate. Like it will feel like a jog for most people, but it's quite important important that you take take those those sessions as, as easy recovery uh, sessions and then the other 20% is left for harder interval training type sessions and maybe tempo type intensity and I think as Tom's describing as these kind of race replication t- 
type performance. But what it means is within those within that twenty percent, you can hit those sessions quite hard, and probably once a week, like be, make sure you're laying on your back fully exhausted, and and you've gone as hard as you possibly can. Um, and it kind of leaves the sort of middle ground untouched if you like a kind of moderate type intensity and I think the mistake a lot of people make is they drift a lot of their easy recovery type runs into that middle type intensity so a lot of their volume during the training week ends up being a little bit too hard and they don't recover well enough from from the harder sessions so I think what Tom's describing there is really appropriate that he has long easy recovery runs which are just building up an aerobic base and then his two or three harder sessions each week where He's trying to simulate race intensities and uh, and doing doing things a, yeah, a little bit harder. I think a, a way that a way that we describe it is you do your easy runs easy, so you can do your hard runs hard. Yeah. And like, what does a hard run look like? Like people will say, like my I know it's so individual, but like on an easy run, like I wear a heart rate monitor for everything. I don't just use heart rate. I don't just use pace. I don't just use feel. I will combine those three bits of data on every run and it midway through a training block you will learn right i know for my easy runs my heart rate is not going to go above one three five beats a minute what does that look like pace on flat that might be four minutes per k that might be six fifteen minute miling but actually on a day that i may have done a track session in the evening or i might be really tired and that Ends up being a bit slower. Or, or yeah. your immune system is going down, and actually that pace drops back. But actually, you're yeah. getting the same benefit because I then know if consistency is the key. That if I am doing my easy runs easy, and I'd much rather do my easy run too easy than my easy run a little bit too hard, because that's then going to enable me to recover. So then, two days down the line, I can do my hard session fully recovered and get the maximum benefit from it, making it as specific as possible and hopefully in the process not getting injured because your training stress level is too high Mm. I think it was the reason I got injured a lot when I was a runner (laughs) like I was more of a middle distance runner but um yeah, had quite a few injuries, probably because I did my easy runs too hard. Um, and like, yeah, my interval sessions were always pretty good, and I'd keep up with with guys that were competing at international level. But I generally do my recovery runs a bit too hard, and I think over time, like, it causes injury. Um, and so it's yeah, it's something that you, you need to avoid and just be a little bit stricter with the way that you're operating during intentional recovery runs. I think that's the thing. Though, is that everybody, everybody thinks, well, if I just go a little bit harder, exactly. Okay a little bit better yeah. but you're saying that in that hard session is where you need to go harder and that's where you'll get better therefore go easier on the easy session so you can go hard again and it almost sounds counterintuitive go slower in order to go yep. faster mm. but and people and it does take a lot of confidence to do it like oh I'm running so much slower than I used to but actually those easy runs I, I, I spent and this is for another podcast, I spent two months in Ethiopia and I was running with guys who were 206, 207 marathoners. My easy run was quicker than theirs. That makes zero sense. And so at that point, I was, and I then reevaluated, like, why am I, what is the purpose of this? I want to feel better when I get back in than I do when I left. And if you honestly look at yourself in the mirror and be like, right, do I feel better now? nine times out of ten probably like like, no that was actually a little bit hard and it should be my heart rate went up a bit I ran a little bit fast to get across the traffic lights and that's not the purpose every run should serve a purpose and when you are in that middle ground people do like people love to talk about junk mileage I see that sort of middle ground somewhere between easy and hard unless you're doing something specifically sort of at Mm. race pace then I see that is that that is where junk miles may pick up like I might do a my first run after a hard session might be the first mile might take 12 minutes <laughs> I'm fortunate enough to have I could keep up with that just enough to have enough time <laughs> no. to do that in the day but if you're if you're sort of worried like oh I need to I've got to go to work at half seven that means I've got to get up at half six in order to run because I have to run six miles this morning you know you're going to have to run at a certain pace well, like, what if you don't feel good mm. that day like are you going to rush it are you going to say oh I have an extra 10 minutes in bed but then have to run 8 minutes quicker so yeah it's a uh, it does take a lot of confidence but mm. it does, it does. that's a big thing for the general population everyone nowadays it's all kind of interval training cramming session and go as hard as you can every single time and then just as previously progress stops and you're not progressing anymore even in an interval session 
you know, I've, I've coached in quite a lot of places, even in interval sessions, where it's the rest time, people are going, can I do a plank? Can I do this? Can yeah. I do that? No, because it's going to absolutely kill you when you do that interval. So yeah. Even in that short space. On your next set, yeah. To do too much. Yeah. But then also not, not necessarily just then. You might only start feeling it a month down the line. Yeah, and by then, the accumulative fatigue. And, yeah, 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 it comes back to this point of consistency that, yeah, it, like most people could be consistent. You'll see in January after Christmas when everyone goes and joins the gym, like people will be consistent through January. But when it gets to February, <laughs> pe- yeah, pe- because of motivation and maybe injuries and so on, like people will start dropping out. And this, the same happens at an elite level that like, most people can be consistent for a few weeks, a few months. But as Tom says, like it takes consistency year on year, not month on month, in order to reach your goals and reach your potential guys I think that's probably plenty for us to have uh, recorded there I knew we could start going on and on different things and stuff but everything you've covered has been absolutely brilliant um, and now that you're on campus Tom we may certainly harass you again to come and do a podcast with us because I think there's a lot of other topics we could cover um, but thanks to both of you for coming along today no, thank you very much thanks Martin and thanks Tom no, thanks very much thanks for listening to the Loughborough Sportcast If you want to get in touch and let us know any subject areas or experts that you'd be keen to listen to, then contact me, Martin Foster, on m.foster at alborough.ac.uk or tweet me at martinfoster82. Bye for now. We'll see you next time.